Okay, I'd like to welcome this morning uh, Nico Pronk. Um, we're going to be talking this morning in our Distinguished Leaders in Sports Medicine and Exercise Science series. And thank you for, for joining us this morning. Thanks for I just us. wanted to start out a little bit with your, your background, your academic training and, and so forth, and then talk a little bit about the, the, some of the books that you're doing and, and the, the organizations that you're involved with and then uh, towards the end talk more about your relationship with the American College of Sports Medicine and, and, and things like that. Yeah. So the, the first thing I wanted to talk about was a little bit about your early career and, and then we'll end with talking more about your relationship with the American College of Sports Medicine. Well, my, my early, or my background, uh, yeah. originally I'm from the Netherlands, uh, grew up in, uh, in Amsterdam area and came to the United States for my undergraduate work. And uh, that was actually, my interest was in physical education. Mm -hmm. Went through a health and physical education uh, undergraduate. Where was that, Nico? This was at Davis and Elkins College in West Virginia. I know it very Elkins, well. Elkins, West Virginia. Yeah, I know it, yeah. I went to undergrad in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah, and yeah. we played them in soccer. Well, how about that? I actually <laughs> was a soccer player. Okay. At Davis and Elkins. Very remember. good, very good soccer there. Yeah, very good soccer and uh, very good experience. Um, actually, remember playing against Penn State. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? mm -hmm. But that was a, a really uh, a good introduction, if you will, to uh, uh, to an education in the United States. What year and was that? This was in 1982 there? through 1986. Okay. 86. And so uh, then, as I was getting into my junior year you know, started the senior year, trying to think through what's next. Decided to pursue an, uh, a master's degree in exercise science mm -hmm. and went to the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Wow. Um, mentor was the Dr. Joe Donnelly, who was also a uh, Davis and Elkins soccer grad. <laughs> so, <laughs> nice connection there. And that really got me, uh, you know, by that time I had also already joined ACSM, but it got me more into the exercise science world. And with so you joined quite early, actually, yeah, in, yeah. in your career, too. Yeah, so. yeah. and, uh, and you know, part of that was AFERT, yes. uh, part of it was ACSM. Mm -hmm. Sort of had you know, exposure there uh, and, and, and really liked it. So then when, when I went into the master's degree uh, program, uh, there was really much more an, an, uh, an exposure to research. Mm -hmm. So it, it came sort of out of the physical activity realm, but then went into the research on the exercise side. Uh, actually, in the context of obesity uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of body composition work, and uh, was that your? Did you do that for your thesis, for your master's thesis? Yeah, yeah. And was that was more organized around uh, obesity and and body composition issues, and then from there went into my doctoral uh, uh, degree at Texas A&M University with uh, Dr. Steve Krause. Mm -hmm. And that was a uh, little bit of a shift from body composition to uh, lipid metabolism um, and, and a variety of different areas. And, uh, and that was a great education as well, great mm -hmm. experience. So that kind of continued me on with a strong relationship with ACSM. And when did you finish your PhD? <coughs> so this was 1992. Okay. 92. Okay. And uh, by this time, um, the picture became pretty clear that, you know, if you're exercising and you have people do physical activity, that the outcome is pretty consistently in the right direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so the, for me, it was sort of a question of like, well, you know, and, and I was in the, clearly in the applied exercise physiology area. My, a lot of my interest was in, you know, helping, you know, sort of people uh, improve their, their level of physical activity, level of physical fitness. But the bigger challenge was how do you get them to do this stuff yeah. versus what happens when you yeah, are actually doing it. Yeah, the motivation part of it. Yeah. The yeah. sort of behavioral side yeah. Of, yeah. of the activity itself. So I actually ended up doing my uh, postdoc at the University of Pittsburgh uh, School of Medicine, the Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic, and mm -hmm. worked with Dr. Rena Wing there, uh, again in physical activity and obesity models, but more on the behavioral side and uh, had a great uh, opportunity to really delve deeper into that side of the world uh, for about a two and a half year time period as a fellow. And then uh, uh, ba you know, after that, uh, moved to Minneapolis uh, and, and joined Health Partners, where I'm still today. Okay. And Were you hired there as a, as a researcher or how, how did you fit in uh, in their structure at the time? 
Yeah, so, so Health Partners is an, uh, an, an integrated health system. It's actually a, a sort of a co-op in the sense that it is a not-for-profit as well as a member-governed health system. I see. So there is a health insurance function to the organization as a, an, an, an one of the early HMOs in this country, mm -hmm. but also a um, uh, hospital system, care delivery system, multi-specialty uh, wow. clinic system, um, s serving about a million two members but with an Minneapolis integrated area, Minneapolis yeah. regional okay. focus, okay. Um, much like Kaiser, yes. that kind of a system. Yes. Uh -huh. um, and uh, in, in, you know, in, inside the, the enterprise, there is an integrated research foundation. So when I joined Health Partners, it was with an eye on uh, implementing a population-based health improvement program that would cover every member of the organization, so one, mm -hmm. one million members or so. Um, but at the same time, evaluate how it's working. Great. Very idea. strongly yeah. measurement and data driven. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of focus on that in, inside the organization. So when, when that opportunity came along, it was sort of like the best of both worlds. Yeah. You know? Perfect. Uh, can you actually do this in the real world? Mm -hmm. And all at the same time, drive a research agenda around it that allows you to measure the progress that's being made mm -hmm. and also generate new questions. Uh, hypotheses in a sense that could be uh, answered Ideal. through a research agenda and that was about 15 16 years ago and we're still at it so <laughs> were you able when you got there to hire other people to help you and with a lot of this stuff yeah actually when this all started uh, within I remember you know I started in October of 94 at health partners and I think by the end of the year we had a cohort up and running um, we actually started hiring uh, other researchers, so PhD level investigators inside the foundation to really uh, sort of drive the agenda on the research side, mm -hmm. but not as a single project by single project, but more a consistent long-term agenda mm -hmm. that really was sort of starting to, uh, to ask more questions on the behavioral side, use the data systems and data structures that were available inside the, uh, the, the, the health system. Mm -hmm. So then connecting, for example, what's the, what's the cost associated with physical yeah. inactivity? Yeah. What is the opportunity to actually do something about that cost? Mm -hmm. what, is the, uh, what is the broader agenda that sort of connects not only physical activity, but other behaviors? So it isn't really that the, uh, the, the health improvement agenda um, is single focus. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is really about health and well-being in general as sort of a robust, broad agenda, turns out physical activity is central to it. Uh, pretty clear that you know physical activity is a central component of active or healthy living, and we th we actually see it as much of a springboard, and uh, sort of almost like a gateway behavior into a whole other uh, set of good things. Well, when you hear Bob Salas talking about his experiences at Kaiser. It sounds like you were you started this in the mid '90s, really, yeah. With, yeah. with your your group. Yeah, and it's been very effective. It's obviously. been extremely effective, uh, and in fact, we we have good good uh, uh, documented outcomes of this agenda, and the outcomes are not only um, in a health perspective, but actually we've we've got these outcomes connected to to what business what drives on the on the business side. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, the total cost of care, for example, and the uh, the issues of return on investment, so that the other stakeholders, not just the the user of the physical activity behavior per se, or health behavior per se, but the the, the variety of stakeholders, which includes the employer, it includes the clinic, care deliver care delivery system, as well as the insurance function, and all of them see their benefit. It's a win-win situation when exactly you, right. because you're putting the emphasis on prevention, yeah. and there's the mo there's a model that's actually working. So yeah. within the context of health care delivery and health care cost, yeah. there's plenty of examples now like yours, of course, that show yeah. this is saving money. And yeah. it's, it's working, and it's it's a. So how do you get to the? How do you get to your one million plus members? What, yeah. How do you get the work? Is it done through their uh, family physician, or is it through mail uh, magazines, yeah. or how, how do you get the put this well, into action? I guess um, for each of the members. Yeah. So on. So if we call this prevention, yeah. Um, and and then with a specific focus on uh, 
primordial and primary prevention. So rather than the, uh, the secondary or tertiary prevention, mm -hmm. you think of it that way. Um, there are a significant number of barriers. Uh, to, and, and in fact, the care delivery system in and of itself is a barrier. Mm -hmm. um, there is just not enough room inside the current system as it is designed to get these primary preventive messages out. You know, you, you, you always hope and you bank on a couple of good, you know, kindred spirits out there mm -hmm. that are trying to make this part of their clinical care delivery process. But the fundamental problem is that the care process doesn't allow you to put this stuff in. Uh, it's not reimbursed. Uh, it doesn't fit in the uh, set of services that are clinically and, uh, and then, of course, the, the physicians are not trained to provide this service. Right. So when you think of it that way, uh, even in the most well-meaning kind of context, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, after 15 years of trying this, I, you know, I, really, I really think that unless you fundamentally create a payment reform structure, that makes this part and parcel of how physicians and care delivery systems Something are reimbursed. That's billable, basically. Billable. Yeah. yeah. And then it also means that it doesn't become a billable service, but make it part of a billable outcome. So that the, the, the payment mechanism for the physician world, if you will, or for the care delivery side, yeah. is not just focused on the services you provide, but rather on the outcomes you generate. And that could be an, uh, you know, a payment mechanism that has multiple components to it. Mm -hmm. That says, you know, first of all, there is a set of services you need to provide and they need to be paid for, but it's not in the absence of paying for the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And if you start paying for outcomes, you're starting to pay for health. Yes. Yeah. And then you get primary prevention in there because that's where most of the action is when it comes to health. So I'm say I'm a member, one of the members of, of, of your group. Um, what what do I see and what do I hear and and how does it filter down to my life? Yeah, in, in your system. So basically, the uh, the the most direct pathways to the person, uh, the, the whether that's the, that person is a member of the plan or a patient in the clinic or an employee at the work site. Okay, so they're um, all. All it's the same person, yes, you know. Yeah, they yeah. just show up as a different right. stakeholder <laughs> right. in a different setting, and and really the two most direct pathways are directly from the health plan to the member, and through the health plan, um, actually through the employer in the worksite setting, as an employee or as a spouse or dependent. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I would argue that today the the best outcomes are through the employer setting. Um, in the employer setting, we can work directly uh, by, by using the health insurance benefit function. You can start building uh, health improvement programs into the design of the benefit structure. Mm -hmm. You can build incentives in, communications in. You can work with the company around cultures of health and really through that mechanism drive huge participation rates. So uh, today in some of our products um, that are really insurance-based products, we, we have uh, over 90% participation rates year over year. Wow. And then you, you really start driving improvement mm -hmm. and you also start driving total cost of care coming down. Uh, people actually see this show up as financial benefit in their own pocket because their premiums go down or their, their, their co-insurance goes down. And it makes a difference in, in their lives financially. It makes a difference in the uh, employer's life. Uh, and, and how they end up paying for the cost of services. Well, I, I remember, I'm guessing, mid-70s, uh, an organization starting called uh, something Fitness in Business, uh -huh. a national organ, and I thought, wow, what a great idea. And, and I remember some early books that had come out about worksite fitness programs, some of the big companies that had these, and that was all very positive. But that was in the mid 1970s. Right. It sounds like this is what you're, you're you're talking about is continuing now, and I'm wondering if that organization still exists or has that changed or yeah. it sounds like you're probably involved in that. Well, funny enough, funny enough, 
um, as you bring up the mid 70s so it actually started as uh, as AFDIBI the association for uh, fitness directors in business and industry that's it yeah and that moved that or, or sort of morphed into the association for fitness in business AFB okay which then eventually became the association for works at health promotion and, and then, that's what it's called now? No, no actually, <laughs> <There's more>. uh, <laughs> AWHP ended up uh, uh, actually uh, running into some trouble in terms of financial, financially finding you know, it itself into a place where it couldn't continue mm -hmm. and actually found a home in 2000 in, within ACSM. Oh. And then about two years ago, that. we resurrected uh, the old AWHP, if you will, as the new... Uh, International Association for Works and Health Promotion, IAWHP, okay. which is an, an ACSM uh, affiliate society today. Okay. And so that association Perfect. is again once once again alive, mm -hmm. um, and I'm currently the president of IAWHP, okay. uh, and we're starting to rebuild, uh, but globally. And so today we have about 220 members again, uh, 11 countries represented about 125 different companies as members and so we uh, were back on the path of making this a reality. A any kind of newsletter yet or anything, uh, meetings or I think you're involved in, you've been involved in books on work site yeah. Yeah. Promo health promotion. Um, actually uh, with, uh, along with ACSM we've uh, created a new uh, 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 work site health handbook uh, and that's the second edition so, uh, and that just came out in early 2009. It's the ACSM's Works at Health Handbook. Um, and that's an, uh, an endorsed by IAWHP. Now and you're, it, in, you're the editor? I'm of the that? editor of, okay. that, of that book. Okay. And, uh, and it really is an, uh, a book that represents close to 100 contributors from around the world. Wow. So it really that's is a good. contemporary, very much an in-depth overview of what the industry is about how to turn those uh, research-based messages into practical applications. Mm -hmm. And it really is a good you know, resource for the field. At the same time, through IAWHP, we actually introduced yesterday at this meeting the, uh, the first uh, issue of a newsletter. So the newsletter is back. It's actually the uh, same name as the old journal in the field, Worksite Health. Mm -hmm. And of course, the objective is now to bring slowly but surely the journal back uh, so that there is really a, once again an, uh, a, a strong resource for the for the field as a whole. Wow, great, great idea. Were you involved in the first edition of the book? Yeah, I was actually a section editor in the first edition. Okay, and uh, when was that? Do you remember when that That was came 2003. Out? Okay. So it was time for an update and yeah. it, it was really a uh, fundamental redesign. It was really, because in the last five to seven years or so, the worksite health promotion industry as a whole has fundamentally changed. Uh, mm -hmm. There has been an enormous amount of uh, mergers and acquisitions in this field. Uh, there used to be just a lot of small companies out there, vendors providing these services. And when disease management really ended up um, uh, recognizing that it needed to, to really serve populations, uh, once w once it's, it recognized that, it really started to buy up the smaller uh, works at health promotion vendors. Mm -hmm. and, and those vendors, in fact, already did a great job of doing population health programs. Um, but when you add to that the disease management kind of programs, mm -hmm. uh, that then became an, a new in, a new what today is the new industry around population health. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, it's, it's really an... Uh, an uh, a merging of all sorts of vendors uh, in different areas. So, you know, some of them online vendors, some of them well-established uh, vendors in the field. But uh, but now, you know, there are quite a few that uh, that that have, that have gone into really four, five, six major vendors today. Mm -hmm. Do you is say there's a company out there uh, that wants to start a health promotion program for their employees. Uh, first of all, are there, I, I would imagine there's still a lot of companies that haven't done this for whatever reason, but where would they turn? Would they turn to this organization for uh, yeah. guidance on how to go about this is, or, or ask, is this in fact a, a good idea? Or yeah. Well, I think, uh, so across the United States today, um, 
probably about close to 90, 85 to 90 percent of companies are doing something oh, good. in this, okay. in this area. I didn't area. think it would be that high. But that well, the problem is that once you sort of get over the first, you know, learning of 89 or, or 85 to 90 percent, then you ask the question, well, so what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And it turns out that it's actually less than 6 percent actually puts programs in place uh -huh. that work. Uh -huh. So when you think about what works, and what actually ends up being a good investment, mm -hmm. it's typically the comprehensive multi-component program that really drives outcomes. And only six or so percent, six to eight percent of companies across the United States do that level of programming. So when you sort of ask the first question, who's doing something, yeah. it's a lot. Yeah. But who's doing something that works, it's actually very few. Do you think it's because it's, it's, it's financially impossible or, th or they just don't know? What's now, right? Or I think, a combination? Or yeah, I think it's it not, not necessarily financially impossible because across the board these programs are actually very low cost. Mm -hmm. uh, th these are compared to medical care, this is not low. You know, this is maybe a, a good program uh, somewhere between $75 to $200 per employee per year. Wow. Yeah, well, if you, compare, if you compare that to the average cost of uh, health care of $8,000 a year per person, mm -hmm. Um, it, it pales in comparison. Yeah. But it is more about um, uh, doing it right and where do you go to understand what right. doing it right really means. Right. Today that I would say is mostly done through consulting companies, consulting firms, um, where healthcare benefits consultants bring in an, ex an area of expertise around health management and those tend to be the companies that work with the larger uh, mm -hmm. employer groups around the, uh, around the country. The smaller employer groups are the ones that are lagging, so the, the small to mid-sized groups really end up uh, finding information on what works or what doesn't work um, through brokerage firms. Mm -hmm. And that is, an, uh, an, uh, I would say, it's, it, they're lagging in terms of, uh, of that, that the, the quality of information that's there. So I think that's where IAWHP really fills that's a what niche. I was wondering, yeah. And the book, in fact, that has come out is being increasingly recognized as the key resource in the field, um, where you know where the variety of, of areas that come together is sort of brought together in one single resource. Mm -hmm. So I think we're we're starting to uh, fill a need uh, in that area, and I think IAWHP, as it goes forward, uh, will increasingly re be recognized as as that place to go for that key information. Mm -hmm. well, I see that all of a sudden a half hour has gone <laughs> by. I told you it would go very fast. So yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for spending some time with us and Thanks for talking us. about yeah. all that. Appreciate it. It was very neat. Thank you. Thank you.